Shoutouts to Raycon for once again sponsoring today's video. As I've said before, I'm really big on music. Greatest hits, video game soundtracks, as long as it sounds good, that's all I need, and having a great set of earbuds is also just as important. And that's where Raycon comes into play. Co-founded by Ray Jang with the backing of top of the line audio engineers and folks in the music industry like Snoop Dogg, Cardi B, and that one naked cowboy who I'm surprised hasn't been arrested yet, Raycon earbuds such as their nice and sleek E25 lineup are just the thing you're looking for when it comes to high quality music listening. They sound just as good as other premium audio brands but at half the price. And you don't have to worry about dangling stems or wires getting in the way of your setup. It's true wireless audio with seamless Bluetooth pairing, super easy to set up. And whether I'm doing household chores or playing around my little furry baby here or working on something outside of my office i got a pair of raycons in my ears they're remarkably comfortable the snug fit does great for noise isolation and you know they just look cool i love putting them back into their charging case when i'm done with them for today the it's the little things i'm very easy to please click the link in the description below to get access to raycons black friday and cyber monday deals get those deals while the deals are good they can make an awesome holiday gift for you or someone special so go ahead and check their site when you can Growing up in the 90s, the word Capcom, to me at least, meant Street Fighter and Mega Man. But starting around 1996, it would also mean Resident Evil. So I've already touched on this earlier this year during that fever dream I had with Resident Evil 2 Remake, but Resident Evil was one of those franchises I've known since its beginning, but didn't really consider playing it until years later. My earliest memory is catching a glimpse of the original PS1 box art back in 1996 when PS1 cases were the size of VHS cassettes, and I recall thinking the dude on the cover looking so weird. I love the abstract background, you can see like all these little tendrils reaching out for Chris, it's chaotic and unnerving, perfect for the kind of game Resident Evil was proclaiming to be. But Chris's face always looked very off to me. He's struggling between two takes here, you mirror the left side and you get a, a Punisher wannabe, you mirror the right side and you get someone who just realized they shat their pants. I wouldn't personally touch the series until Resident Evil 4 in early 2005, and to jump ahead here as I said before, I ended up loving RE4 so much that it convinced me to go back and play the other games in the franchise starting with the first one, and that's where we are today. Originally conceived as a Super Nintendo game in 1993, and then later planned to be a fully 3D first-person adventure during the PS1's early days, producer Tokuro Fujiwara of Ghost and Goblins fame ugh, was tasked with remaking his 1989 original for the Famicom Sweet Home, with Shinji Mikami in the director's chair. Now at this point, Shinji Mikami was only known for designing licensed third-party titles like Who Framed Roger Rabbit on the Game Boy, the SNES version of Aladdin, and Goof Troop. So to go from something as silly as Goofy to... Ah! Yeah, bit of a leap, but Mr. Mikami would later go on to work on other notable titles such as Dino Crisis and The Evil Within, just to name a couple, so dude's likely a horror buff. Resident Evil, also known as Biohazard in Japan because apparently it'd be impossible to trademark the term Biohazard in North America, was officially released for the PlayStation in 1996 and has since seen a couple of re-releases. In 1997, it would see a Sega Saturn release that had some extra costumes and a couple of new enemies added, but good luck trying to find a copy at a reasonable price. The game would also get a director's cut that would add a new difficulty and extra costumes for our protagonists not seen elsewhere, and then a year after that, it would get another director's cut with DualShock support. It then saw a PC release that also contained the uncensored versions of the opening movies in full color as well. First game of a new Capcom franchise and it's already getting the Street Fighter treatment. Though this was mainly done to tide fans over until the release of the hotly anticipated Resident Evil 2, which suffered a humongous delay which I'll cover next time. There was also a version planned for the Game Boy Color of all things, but this would end up being scrapped due to the system's limited hardware, to which I say, well, yeah, <laughs> was that not obvious before they considered production? That said, a ROM of this version exists and has been leaked, and you can see for yourself what the game would have looked like with the quick YouTube search, and despite being on inferior hardware, you know, it's not a bad attempt at all. Pretty ambitious, I would even say. But given it was scheduled for a 1999 release, three years after the original came and went, it probably wouldn't generate enough buzz, so financially speaking, maybe it was for the best that it wasn't finished. Still, a handheld version of Resident Evil 1 would eventually see the light of day in the form of Resident Evil Deadly Silence on the Nintendo DS in 2006 to celebrate the game's 10th anniversary. I never owned this version, so I won't be covering it in this video, but from what I can tell, it seemed like a pretty faithful port of the PS1 game now with added dual screen support. So I'd imagine that's pretty good for keeping track of your location. Who knows, I might talk about it later. 
The one version most of you are likely more familiar with is the 2002 remake originally released for the Nintendo GameCube, dubbed Resident Evil Remake by fans. I'm going to go more in depth with my thoughts on this one when I get to Resident Evil Zero since I feel these two games complement each other and it'd be better suited to talk about it then. I wanted to spend today on the PS1 original and just for clarity's sake I played the Jill scenario on the original 1996 release and the Chris scenario on the DualShock version of the director's cut eh, just because there's some differences which I'll get into but it's largely the same game. Just something I felt like doing. If I had the time and disposable income, I'd also look at the Saturn and DS versions if I could, but I think this would be fine enough. But before any of that, I actually uh, wanted to start on the game that would inspire this game, and that is Tokoro Fujiwara's Sweet Home for the Famicom. As you probably guessed, this was a Japanese-only release, and a tie-in to the 1989 Japanese horror film also called Sweet Home. The game is basically an adaptation of the film, where a five-man documentary film crew enter this abandoned house in hopes of recovering paintings created by this famous artist named Ichiro Mamiya. Unfortunately, as soon as they enter the mansion, they find themselves trapped inside thanks to this malevolent spirit, so the team needs to work together to find a way out of the house. And the crew has their work cut out for them, the house is falling apart, there are monsters everywhere, and they're stuck with barebone RPG mechanics that wasn't out of place for the 80s, I guess. Beating the game requires proper item management and careful use of every character's unique trait. Kazuo can use a lighter to burn things like dreaded ropes that block the passage, because you can't walk over them or limbo under them I suppose, Emmy can pick certain locks with her special key, Akiko can nurse others back to health if they suffer from status effects, Taro can use his camera to take pictures which reveals clues whenever you find one of these paintings, and Asuka, um, I guess she drew the short straw because she has a vacuum that could be used to suck up broken glass because I guess there's no other way to walk over it. I mean it makes sense in the context of the story, she's an art restorer, the vacuum was meant for the paintings, but in a life or death situation, whew, fate hated her guts. The game isn't too long, but it's very annoying, and that's the best I can classify it. Now, I don't want to give it too much shit because it was a late 80s RPG, and those all had archaic design choices. It's just, when you have to go back to it, it's like, ugh, I don't miss any of this. Though there are five of you, you can't all stick together at once, and used to be at least two parties. So you'll likely be exploring the mansion with a team of three and a team of two, but sometimes you'll get to an area that requires someone not in your team, so you have to switch back to the team they're in and then make your way to the area the other group is located. This wouldn't be too much of a problem if the game didn't have random encounters. It's an RPG after all, and I did feel a little tense when I encountered my first creature. I'm getting ready to explore, then suddenly I can't move. I hear this music start building up, and then wham, I'm fighting a ghost or a killer doll, or perhaps the worst enemy of all, man. Okay, that's all fine, but eventually the encounter started to wear on me, and it didn't help that mechanically they weren't very interesting. You can attack with whatever weapon you can manage to find in the mansion, and it's a healthy dose of them to be fair, but you're not doing anything else besides attacking or using these prey points to make your next attack hit harder. But you shouldn't do that all the time because you also need prey points to activate certain things to solve puzzles. You can restore prayer points and health by locating these tonics, but there's a limited amount of these, so that's something you have to consider when battling. Unless I absolutely needed to, I found myself running away from a lot of encounters, which I noticed is kind of a trend with me with RPGs I don't really enjoy. You don't get anything from battles besides experience points, so unless you want to hit things harder, which you can kind of already accomplish by finding better weapons as I feel this game is primarily based on the kind of weapon you're using and not so much how many levels you gain, battles only serve to drain resources. With a few exceptions, most encounters are just a round of happy slaps anyway. There are some that can inflict status effects, and those can suck, like the stunned effect? I don't get this one, so a character gets stunned, they can't attack, okay, that makes sense. But everyone else in your party suddenly can't attack the enemy, they start attacking the stunned player. What? How does that work? Am I stunned, or is everyone else confused? What's the correlation? You better hope you have Akiko close by when this happens because it is frustrating as fuck to deal with otherwise. Then there's some enemies who can blow party members away and not just from battle but to an entirely different location in the mansion. You're out there, you're making progress, and then you can encounter something like this wraith asshole and they manage to get it hidden and now your buddy is all the way out in West Bubblefuck and that's a lot of time wasted just getting everyone back together. If this was any other RPG, I'd rather just take a death, but that's not an option in Sweet Home, for if a character dies, whether in battle or because of a booby trap, they're gone for good. This game has permadeath, and you don't want to deal with that. You lose that character, you lose their special trait, and then you'll have to rely on items you find in the mansion to pick up the slack. Like if you lose Asuka, you can't use her vacuum to pick up the glass, god forbid, and you'll now have to rely on these brooms you can only find in certain spots to do the job. And considering that this game is already rocking an impressively limited inventory, I'd argue you're better off resetting the game if you lose someone, though this game does have multiple endings if you decide to stick it out. Every character can hold on to their weapon of choice, their unique item, and two other things. I thought Earthbound Beginnings was strict, but goddamn. On top of making sure you have the right character for the job when they're needed, you also need to consider who's carrying what. 
Who's holding the special keys needed to open the door up ahead? Who's gonna be potion bitch for when you need some emergency healing? Who's gonna hold the rope or wood plank for when you have to cross large gaps? And are you gonna carry two of them so that both parties can cross at once? Or will you use the rope for one group, separate that person to join the next group, and then bring them to the large gap so that they can cross? There is a surplus of item management in this game, a surplus of back and forth progression, a surplus of trial and error, a surplus of archaic design. It's what you're spending most of the game dealing with, and I'm not terribly surprised, but I was very much happy to be done with the game once I got to the credits. So the ghost ends up being the spirit of Lady Mamiya, Ichiro Mamiya's wife. A long time ago, the couple's young baby was burnt alive in the house's incinerator, effectively driving Lady Mamiya mad. She then proceeded to kill other children to give her dead child playmates in the afterlife, and then wound up committing suicide when she couldn't take it anymore. But because of the circumstances, her spirit became trapped in the house. So eventually, it's up to the group to confront her directly and put her spirit at ease. It's a pretty simple plot on the surface, but one that still manages to deliver a good sense of dread, which I find doubly impressive considering the hardware. Though I wasn't a fan of the game mechanically speaking, and it isn't very long, I found great pleasure in experiencing the game's aesthetic nevertheless. It's clear where Resident Evil took inspiration. The game is great in making you uneasy. From the limited inventory make a progression tense, the fact that you can permanently lose party members making the journey more arduous, and just thinking of that alone can make you flustered, you never know when the game might give you a scare. Unlocking doors comes with a door opening animation that you might find familiar. I'm playing this game and every time I see this scene I keep expecting something to pop from the other side. You can find these skeletons and corpses on the ground, and though most are just there for decor, some might suddenly jump up and give you a little 3am jolt. But jump scares are one thing, you know, just something that could be viewed as cheap, but I was startled to see how much brutal imagery this game had. From discovering a burnt corpse of a child in a coffin to watching a man fucking melt in front of my face. <laughs> Shit, an NES game managed to catch me off guard and disturb me. That's quite the feat, kudos. Though Resident Evil put the survival horror genre on the map, Sweet Home in a lot of ways codified the term. It's been quite interesting having experienced this to see what would inspire the first game in the Resident Evil series, even if I did find it mostly tedious and archaic. I'd say go grab yourself a copy, but unless you can read Japanese, you're better off getting yourself a translated reproduction cartridge. It's how I played the game for this video. Or you can find a ROM, that shouldn't be too difficult. I normally wouldn't condone that, but seeing it's very unlikely that Sweet Home would ever get re-released in any capacity, I don't see the harm. I doubt Capcom is making money from Sweet Home nowadays anyway. But using Sweet Home as a basis, Capcom would eventually release Resident Evil in 1996, and in many ways you can consider RE1 to be like a reimagining of Sweet Home. You know, you're stuck in a mansion with your associates and you have to work together to ensure survival and to eventually find a way to get the hell out of there. A series of grisly murders have been occurring in the Arkali Mountains in the outskirts of Raccoon City. Evidently, the victims of the murders were cannibalized by a large group of people. The Raccoon City Police Department deployed the Special Tactics and Rescue Service, also known as STARS, to investigate the murders and see what they could find. The first group, known as the STARS Bravo Team, would eventually locate what they assumed was the hideout of the group, but then soon disappeared. In response, STARS Alpha Team was called into action, consisting of Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, Barry Burton, and captain of the team, Albert Wesker. Mm. They're sent to the Arkalay Mountains to recover Bravo Team and to make sure everything was all right, but things are not all right. Bravo Team's crashed helicopter is soon discovered, as well as the bloody remains of some team members. With little time to process what they're looking at, the team is soon attacked by a pack of rabid, mutated dogs, forcing them into the nearby mansion when the helicopter pilot of the Alpha Team suddenly takes off in a panic. Yeah, thanks, Brad, you piece of shitty motherfucker. Inside the mansion, the gang decide to split up and see if they can locate the remainder of Bravo Team and to see if they can find a way out. And if you're thinking why they don't just use the front door, there you go. But little do the STARS team know that something sinister lurks within the mansion, for a viral outbreak has transformed the folks and animals inside into undead monstrosities. Though the game has a fair share of cutscenes, most of it can be summarized as Chris and Jill reacting to the next horror they come across. Very minimalistic, emphasizing this mysterious side of the story. Who's responsible for this? How did it get this bad? The real meat of the story is told in these diary entries and research files scattered about the mansion. While most don't give definitive answers, they often go into detail from the perspective of those affected by the epidemic in some pretty chilling ways. And these I find are magnificent in building fear and anxiety. There's something clearly wrong here, but learning the context is just as terrifying. But personally, I kind of wish these were more integrated into the plot. These bits are more for the player's benefit so that we can get more of an idea of how things are going down. But rarely, if ever, do we see the main characters react to it. I'm going to try and see if I can explain this well. Forgive me if I'm not being clear enough. Chris and Jill never take the time to self-reflect or monologue about their current predicament. 
Like, we never really learn about who these characters are besides the fact that they, you know, belong on stars. Every time these two manage to meet up with their partner, be it Barry or Rebecca, it's always the same, whoa, this place is dangerous, or I'm gonna check out things on this end. While I'd imagine Chris and Jill don't wanna extend their stay any longer than they have to, it is a dire situation, to put it lightly. I would've liked to hear the characters talk more about their surroundings and the situation to get a better idea of who these are as people, you know, without having to manually check all the environments with the X button all the time, you know? But eventually, as the two explore deeper into the mansion, they discover the other members of Star's Bravo team either brutally eviscerated or on the verge of death. Enrico yeah. warns Chris or Jill that there's a traitor among the Star's team, but before he can say any more, he's killed shortly after. Soon it's all revealed that the viral outbreak was the fault of the Umbrella Corporation, a pharmaceutical company that's been secretly developing bioorganic weapons for military purposes, and that the Star's team was deliberately sent to the mansion not so much to rescue Bravo team, but so they can act as guinea pigs to collect battle data for Umbrella's new experiments. At the helm of all this is the captain of the stars team, Albert Wesker. You know, if the whole sunglasses at night wasn't a big enough indicator that he's a villain. Mm. Wesker all this time has been manipulating our heroes, leading them to the secret underground research lab, where he then unleashes the tyrant on them, Umbrella's latest super weapon. Depending on the character you play, Wesker either gets away off screen or gets impaled by the very creature he unleashed, the latter being confirmed as canonical. That's kind of a weird thing with this game. You're given the choice between Chris or Jill when you begin a new game, and their campaigns are largely similar, but their means of progression are a bit different. In Jill's campaign, she's accompanied by Barry Burton, who at certain points can get Jill out of a bind, and then spends the rest of his time fluctuating between emotions. What is it? Was that, was that a chuckle, Barry? What the fuck? The thing just ate Kevin priorities, man. In Chris's scenario, he eventually teams up with Rebecca Chambers, the youngest member of a military force I've ever seen, and one of the only remaining members of Star's Bravo team. She doesn't help Chris as often as Barry helps Jill, but in certain cases she can patch up Chris's injury, seeing as she's the Star's medic. Besides that, she doesn't really do much. She plays a piano to open a door because Chris can't read music, and she helps Chris escape a plant boss because Chris can't do math. Did he not finish high school? I don't get it. What's weird is that when you play as Jill, there isn't a single mention of Rebecca. And in Chris's scenario, Barry flat out vanishes before the game begins proper, despite being mentioned earlier. And that's never resolved. It's like when you play both games, you can fill in the blanks but put them together, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Before future games elaborated on certain details, I'd imagine it was confusing on what was canon or not. Either way, if you play your cards right, Chris and Jill confront the tyrant head-on, ending with them stuffing a propelled rocket down its throat, a pretty badass way of ending things. Then our heroes activate the self-destruct sequence in the lab, make their escape via helicopter thanks to Brad coming back, and the mansion explodes into a million sequels and spin-offs. This is all assuming you do the correct things while playing, because the game has multiple endings depending on who lives and dies. I want to say it's not terribly confusing on how to get the best ending, it's easier to get with Chris and Jill if you ask me. But if you're not sure, I'd say it wouldn't hurt to check a guide if getting the best ending is what you like to do. I like this story. It's minimalistic by default to play up the mystery of what's really going on, to heighten the game's tension, and to get you to press on to see how things unfold. But reading the supplementary files and such in the mansion is also a good, interactive way of engaging the player. I'd be lying though if a good chunk of my enjoyment didn't also stem from how hilariously awful the presentation is. It was the PlayStation's early days, I won't be overly critical, but this is before games like Metal Gear Solid where production values were held in higher regard. The music's great though, the synth reminds me of a lot of 80s horror and slasher films, and this also extends to the second director's cut. Yeah, for some reason the soundtrack was completely replaced when the DualShock version of the director's cut was released. The first soundtrack was the combined efforts of Makoto Tomozawa, Koichi Hiroki, and Masami Ueda, but the rework was credited to Mamoru Samuro Gochi, and if you know anything about this man, it was likely Takashi Nigaki who actually composed the music. Since since Mamoru Samuro Gochi later admitted that his music was ghost written and he couldn't compose for shit, except for maybe the kitchen music. You can tell me this was made by someone who didn't actually write their own songs and you know, I, I believe it. Ghost written or not, the director's cut music isn't that bad, there are even some tracks I enjoy more in this version than I do in the original. But I don't know, that could be my Animusha bias speaking as Takashi Nagaki also composed a soundtrack for that game and I fucking love the soundtrack of the first Animusha, oh my god. A review for another time. Let's see here, I also love the live action opening. Reminds me of those cheesy Sega CD FMV games. These folks feel like interns the development team picked up during a coffee run. The acting is awful, but it's incredibly fun to riff on. In-game character animations are about as stilted as the tank controls, the writing is borderline abysmal, and you can think the voice acting is either bad or hilarious, and there is no in-between for that when it comes to this game. Seeing as it's clearly trying to emulate a silly B-horror film, I think that works to its benefit. Yeah, it really feels like there was no proper voice direction when dialogue was recorded, but it does lead to some great moments, unintentional or otherwise. It's me, Chris. Is that you, Rebecca? 
My favorite has to be Wesker. He spends the whole game pulling strings from behind the scenes so that he can get his team to fight the tyrant, given the impression that he's a sociopathic puppet master. But the moment he shows the monster to Chris... <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Stop it. That really hurt his feelings. And then when the tyrant breaks free and heads after Chris, Wesker gives Chris the look and simply says, Go to hell. Oh my god, you, you can just feel the insecurity dripping from this man's hairdo. What a bitch. I love this. It's, it's not everyone's cup of tea. And by the remake, things are taken a little more seriously, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, but there's much more to enjoy than what I just highlighted. <laughs> So to get more into the gameplay here, both Chris and Jill are capable of wielding firearms and other means of combat, like a slow and awkward knife that I wouldn't recommend using. But they also have specific quirks. Jill has a smaller health pool, but she can use a lockpick to unlock certain things without the need of a key. And she has a slightly bigger inventory, so you can carry more at once, leading to less backtracking. And she can eventually get the bazooka that can shoot out three different types of ammunition if you manage to find them. Meanwhile, Chris... Chris... Chris, okay, in the original, Chris didn't really have shit besides a bigger health pool. I thought he always had the lighter at his disposal to light certain objects, but that's only in the remake. His inventory is smaller, he needs small keys to open up compartments that contain extra ammo that Jill has no problem opening herself, so that's even more items to consider carrying. For all intents and purposes, Chris is the hard mode. The bigger health pool is great, don't get me wrong, but he has more enemies to deal with and less item space, meaning a lot more item management and way more back and forth. If I'm ever going back to this game, I tend to stick with Jill. Yeah, I know she's meant to be the easier mode, but getting access to better weapons and getting help from Barry is one thing, but her larger inventory size and lockpick makes her journey flow better, I feel. And that's what I enjoy the most about her. I can feel comfortable carrying this battery I need to power up an elevator and still have room for a healing herb or a box of shotgun rounds just in case I run into trouble along the way. In Sweet Home, if there was an item you didn't need at the moment, you had to leave it on the ground by swapping with another item in the vicinity. This meant having to go back to that specific area later if you suddenly needed that item again, and with something like an important key, ugh, <laughs> it was a pain. In Resident Evil, you have these item boxes where you can place items you don't need in storage until you need them later, and through the power of 90s cloud servers, you can reacquire these items from any item box you find. They're all linked, which doesn't make much sense, but for gameplay purposes, it's mighty convenient and I like that. That said, you'll still be visiting item boxes a whole bunch because like in Sweet Home, getting through the mansion requires that you solve puzzles and such by properly using items you find in the mansion. Certain doors that can only be unlocked with the right key, getting past a dangerous plant creature by using chemicals, you can describe most of Resident Evil's gameplay as finding X to solve Y, but there's also some challenges that can only be solved with keen observation, and there's also some combat thrown in there to spice things up, or to frustrate you. Chris and Jill can defend themselves. Combat is often discouraged because of limited healing items, limited ammo, the resilience of certain enemies, and the circumstances of the encounter. Also, tank controls. I think this game was one of the pioneers of this control scheme, and though I think it's something you can adapt to with enough practice, it nevertheless makes you as mobile as a spinning rotisserie chicken. If you're not willing to adapt to it off the bat, I can say now, that this game isn't for you. Hell, the next few games might not be for you. It's an intentional design hindrance to accentuate the game's tension, but sometimes it is more frustrating than scary Often you're fending off zombies and other bioorganic weapons in tight corridors and hallways, and in some unfortunate cases, it can be easy as hell to get comboed, leaving you completely helpless, and that sucks. In this game, it's a requirement that you learn to maneuver around things you don't need to waste bullets on, which can be its own challenge given the controls and pre-rendered camera angles. While it would be easier to put the enemy down for safe passage, that's ammo you no longer have for a fight you might need it for later on. There's little buildup for larger encounters, so on your first playthrough, you have no idea when you run into something like the Cerberus dog or a zombie shark or those godforsaken hunters. This also applies to boss fights. There isn't many of them, but you just run into them with little fanfare, so your ass better hope you prepare it when it's showtime, because now it's suddenly do or die, assuming you can't make a hasty retreat. No matter what though, these aren't very good. The fight against Yawn, the giant snake, on both occasions is a luck of the draw. If you're nimble enough during the first encounter, you can grab the item you came for and book it, but the tank controls on top of the awkward room design will ensure that Yawn almost always manages to trap your ass and then take a bite out of you. And if it manages to poison you, specifically as Chris, you gotta do this whole extra thing with Rebecca just to continue playing normally. It's one thing when your controls are limited, it's another when boss encounters feel like they weren't exactly designed with that control scheme in mind. To stop dead in your tracks just to get a good shot, all while the boss is quickly adjusting and preparing to strike, leaves a very clumsy feeling design that I never look forward to whenever I revisit this. Now, Director's Cut somewhat mitigates this by adding an auto-aim feature, making snap decisions easier to manage, though with the tank controls, there's still times where you have to awkwardly turn in place to either get a better shot or to run away in the proper direction. I'd tell you to save your game often just to be safe, but there's even a limit on that. You save your game by visiting these typewriters, but in order to use them, you need to have an ink ribbon, and even then you need to make sure you have room for that. There's several of them scattered about, some even close to the typewriter 
operator in question, but there is a finite number of them. Blow through them all too early and you'll progress through the opening part of the game just fine, no doubt, but good luck trying to get through the other parts of the game without so much as a scratch if it's your first time. Besides the tank controls, this is another make it or break it point about this game. Classic Resident Evil in general, really. Putting a limit on saves can be a great way of putting players on the edge. How much do you think you can get away before making another save? Do you think it's wise, now that you have the next key needed to explore more of the mansion, to just barge right in without taking any precautions? That can be a little intimidating, or it could be an arcade design choice that might have worked then, but doesn't work at an age where saving is usually a free action, if not automatic. I think it works as a deliberate gameplay mechanic, but I also say that as someone who's played this game a few times and knows a thing or two about how it works. I don't think this game is terribly hard. Tokuro Fujiwara might have helped produce the game, but I certainly wouldn't call it Ghost and Goblins hard, no. But if you need something to make those bitter herbs easier to swallow, the director's cut has a beginner mode, which not only gives you more ammo and health, but it also doubles the amount of ink ribbons you get, meaning you can save a lot more. But if I'm being real here, in today's day and age, you're better off just playing the 2002 remake. There's really no reason to go back to the PS1 original other than novelty's sake. The voice acting, the cutscenes, the things people generally poke fun at, you can look at those with a simple YouTube search without spending a dime. This game set the foundation, and there is something to be enjoyed and respected going through an experience in the franchise's roots. But the game hasn't aged well visually, the design of the mansion can make navigation clunky in a game where you already have clunky controls, the enemy placement can be horribly unfair, the boss fights aren't very good, there's just much better games to enjoy in this series. At the very least, the game is super cheap on the PlayStation Store, so at least you're not breaking bank. So next up in this marathon, we're heading back, uh, or forward, I guess, to a game I already discussed earlier this year, but I'm not just talking about the remake, I'm talking about the original Resident Evil 2. Uh, I'm holding the GameCube version, but you know, I might look at the PS1 version, N64. There's so many re-releases of this game, but I'll save that for the actual video. Thank you all for watching, have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care. Oh, I can't believe it. Are you okay? Yeah, so much for him, we got to the root of the problem. Boo, you stink! <laughs>